This is CUNY TV, the television station of the greatest urban university in the world. As the sun sets at the end of a New York workday, the mind transitions from daily tasks to the cloudier, more philosophical regions of social issues, culture, and politics. In a democracy, every perspective on the world is important, and people in art and culture have surprising bodies of knowledge that can shed fresh light on today's reality. The following conversations with artists Hugh Hayden and Cheryl Donegan took place at that time of the day. Hugh Hayden is an artist based in New York. His sculptures, fantastically unsettling versions of picket fences, dining room tables, and other domestic forms, often made from varieties of salvaged wood, speak to the fissures and tensions in American life. Did you make a decision at some point to say, did you say that I'm not going to design spaces or buildings, I really want to explore what can happen in a discourse of art? There was a moment when, when I first met someone who's in New York City who said they were like an artist and that was like their <laughs> source of income and like what that's just what they did and like I had never met someone like that in my life. I'm from, I'm from Dallas and like I always went to the sort of schools where the goal was to be like a doctor, a lawyer, a business person, a dentist. My brother's a lawyer and we went to the yeah. same schools and so that wasn't like, even though there was like these private schools and whatnot and even my high school had this like a museum in it. But, and I went to the Muse Dallas Museum of Art every Wednesday in eighth grade. But within all the education, like art wasn't like a career path. And mm -hmm. even at Cornell, when I was there for architecture school, some of the art students were more like laissez-faire about things. Mm -hmm. I, I like ran a student publication and I would, would really have to try to, not coerce, but try to really encourage like art students to participate in it. It yeah. was like a creative publication. And it's funny because you only meet kind of grown-up artists in New York City yeah. <laughs> who, who take it. It's their career, you know, mm -hmm. they, they are professional artists. Uh, but I think that there's an idea among young people that artists are just kind of skateboarding and doing graffiti or whatever form that takes. But actually, um, and maybe it's just more about the exploratory period people go through before they actually kind of start showing and have deadlines and things yeah. like that. I mean, there definitely was the aspect of it. I thought I was going to continue working as an architect for 10 more years and like, maybe at some point get a representation by a gallery or mm -hmm. get into shows like you know you, you could wait your whole life for an opportunity you know there's a combination of right place right time but also dedication to the work I, I was making and really believing in it was the yeah. best and sort of like an opportunity presented itself I was like out of vacation days and I, I like you know this was the chance like uh, like mm -hmm. this opportunity to have a show with listen in September mm -hmm. uh, and I and I right after I had the show at white columns and you know, which itself was this like perfect opportunity and like exhibition for people to see my work. It was one of the first shows and the, when they reopened in the new space. You know, that was an amazing platform to like, you know, giving like sort of this uh, broad access to my work. I didn't actually think it would be, I would so immediately become an artist in terms of a source of income and, and, and uh, you know, now I would say I was more of a full-time artist. It seems to me like you're part of a group of young artists now, whatever medium they're working in, who are doing things that are kind of surreal, which feels to me not like the old surrealism, which was a kind of like convulsion of society, but it's maybe an exploration of kind of what the underlying social issues are and what maybe what a future might look like in some ways. I would say I think of my work in a really multi-layered sort of way in that sure. there are some things that are couldn't be more obvious depending on the perspective in which you look at them. But often uh, there's this goal that they're sort of open to multiple interpretations mm -hmm. and different readings by different people. But you know, ultimately say with a tree, like I have this interest in like if I can change the way you view something so ubiquitous mm -hmm. as like a tree, something you take for granted, something you've known your whole, li whole life. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of the earth has trees, not everywhere, but, but if I'm able to sort of transform how you think about that, mm -hmm. sort of in this sort of surreal way, you know, I can change how you think about other things. Do you collect wood in different places though? I mean, you kind of salvage wood. That's the basis of the materials, right? I have salvaged some woods, and so I'm interested in the woods sort of material histories 
uh, material properties and and in terms of the sort of histories that might be like the different little sort of social significances, how wood can even be politicized. I actually am paying someone to cut down some trees right now, but mm -hmm. there's a very specific type of tree. It's like actually like a hundred year wood in terms of its like outdoor properties. And it's about the properties, I mean, as in anyone would want a particular kind of wood for some special project, but you also select based on where it's coming from. Yeah. For this show coming up with Listen in London, we're using these um, hornbeam trees and uh, chestnut trees. And the chestnuts, I believe, were planted by the Romans like uh, when they had conquered the UK and they, or it wasn't called that, but Britain. And um, this- They planted LA's, right? Yeah, and, and pass a roadway, pass, uh, and that through coppicing, which is this process of like putting back the trees to the roots or certain, mm -hmm. to a certain level, um, the trees that I'm using from the show that sort of d demarcate this border sort of are technically from this like, you know, thousands of year old sort of rootstock. Yeah. It's never just a piece of wood, right. like even like a piece of plywood, like OSB plywood. It's sort of similar. It's this like global thing that it's like often in many things around us. We never see it. It might be in any country and that it no longer has this sort of like site specificity as like an oak tree in Texas or a mesquite tree that it's more of this sort of global wood that sort of would define a person today. Plywood's a little bit like the crab legs you get, which are not n not real crab. As an American social class, like plywood is kind of like suburbia or something like that. It's very consistent throughout the country. It's all composite. It's heterogeneous, yeah. Yeah, it's a composite of different kinds of things. But I think architecture's kind of taken the same demotion. I mean, there are giant phallic buildings right here um, out the windows, but, but, but also I think landscape architecture has become that way of thinking that's more kind of um, broadly social and universal in some ways. Talk about the, uh, in terms of architecture, especially uh, the Princeton um, project. That's up now, right? Bainbridge House in Princeton, which the art museum has bought, and now they're using it as a contemporary art center, right? So, yeah, to showcase emerging art. And so you have an installation there. Do you want to describe that? It's one of the oldest buildings in Princeton, New Jersey, across the street from the main university campus. Mm -hmm. And uh, essentially, I have the four ground floor gallery spaces I've sort of that still have their existing architecture moldings. It's a very like domestic part of the architect in me is like, you know, to engage that with my work that um, how could some existing works that I've made as well as some works I wanted to make that were more related to broader interests of mine, how they could one, be their own wor works of art and either have their own what, intent, but it mm -hmm. also heightened their experience because of the contextualness of being in this like period house yeah. that you, enables you to draw different conclusions. I mean, one piece in particular, it looks like it's a dining room. It's a table with chairs, but the chairs have spikes, essentially, where you would sit. I think that piece is called America, right? Essentially, it's modeled after my childhood kitchen table, which is more set, kitchen table set, which typically is more defined by it being an oak table made out of press back chairs, which mm -hmm. has this early root as a sort of early sort of uh, uh, democratic gesture of making a wood carved chair. The history of the building revealed some things that, that inspired what you did there, right? But I was actually less interested in the sort of like this, the slave narrative of the, that there was there, because there's a larger project going on at Princeton right now, the slavery at Princeton and sort of coming to terms with that. I mean, there are different rings that could come from the work, but I wanted to use the sort of the contextualization of this period house. Um, for me, it was because it was this period house and it created this certain decorative d domestic space that was like enough in terms of it to enhance a reading of the space and to even place certain things within a time. Like specifically with these, like there are these cast iron skillets that are in the kitchen mm -hmm. sort of space, 3D scammed objects from the collection of both African origin and from other cultures, whether they're Roman. From the art museum, right? Yes, from, uh, or Egyptian or even, uh, you know, from modern art, like a Gauguin's little figurine of a woman of Martinique. It was more of to one that's sort of interested in like looking at the African origins that have like, sort of inflected America but mm -hmm. um, and not from a, this sort of academic a historical way but sort of remixing the past and sort of that artwork you know can like challenge like your convictions and the way you think about the past and the present and the future and they sort of create this new narrative of this sort of Afrofuturist idea of like mm -hmm. to cook pancakes in that what would that mean and sort of this yeah. idea of coming from this like Egyptian like mythology. We all have our own personal points of view and I think that's a natural thing for anyone to mm -hmm. use in the art they make but I imagine though that sometimes in 
there, there's an expectation that, that a person will do things that are based on sexuality or based on race or based on gender. I imagine people encounter that, especially as artists um, coming up through the ranks. It's funny, I think specifically with a lot of my wooden work, some people aren't, and my name, they're not expecting me to be a black person. Like the first work I was making was this sort of um, subverting these like North American like taxidermied animals to like uh, African American vernacular hair styling techniques to so, like corn rowing a buffalo uh, or a mountain goat you know and that was a very specific sort of tw this one culture's relationship uh, to this greater society and part of me like my interest in like nature and camouflage has been this idea of like blending in into like to society, yeah. and so that like often it's become more nuanced, especially not knowing anything about me and have a total different reading, and that that's one thing I I not say strive for, but I I do intend typically like my work to be able to have multiple meanings, so you can't just view it as the, as this one thing, because I also do these food projects, which are just like these sculptures that have this element of wanting to participate in them, but they also have this dark part. Or this something that's more like critical, not only of, of, of what it's happening, but even potentially how it implicates you as the sort of viewer. These are like culinary performances, right? Yeah, I call them uh, culinary installations. So there was like a, di a Thanksgiving meal I had, I organized where the guests were given like a button-down shirt that essentially it tethered via a rope that attached to the, their wrist through a series of pulleys under the table so that every person's wrist was attached to a different person and they only had six inches of motion or of movement to eat a family In style meal. Eat, you have to coordinate your movement. Yeah, to eat or to pass the green beans, cut the turkey, open bottle of wine, you know, everything now became like a dialogue. You know, there was this sort of consciousness of having to interact with this group. And that's a great metaphor for just the social dynamic of getting along or not getting along just in your ability to physically like eat at the table. But I guess then if somebody knows that you're a black artist or something, then it has to reference to shackles or something like that, which, which is kind of too crude, I think, for... Um... Well, specifically with that one, I didn't use chain, I used rope. It was it became more about the movement. People tend to think that there's a kind of like a, a key to any work of art that you can reduce it to to just a basic idea, and it often I think they often look to the artist, the biography of the artist, to solve that riddle. But I mean, true art that that is that is good is like really nuanced in many ways. I think it it it, it maybe has something to do with the interests of the person or who they are, but it often goes way beyond that if it's if it's doing its job. Typically there's the, there's things embedded in the work that probably only like maybe a close friend would. But it's also like I've I've made these football helmets. Most people a lot of people think they're about concussions, which to me it's not, but it's that's a way in. I'm not gonna say what the, everything that they're about, but they're like It's not your most, job to yeah, interpret, honestly. Yeah, but it's kinda nice to hear people reinterpret something. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's in a way often when it which I might not have thought of. Mm -hmm. Because one element of, for example, these skillets, there's one, I can't say that Mogdigliani, but also with the Gauguin statue in it, they're juxtaposed to these African masks, and it's more about, in that case, this idea of this modern art being influenced by this African culture. And so mm -hmm. there's, there's different dialogues at play, that there's not one sort of like reading, yeah. uh, that or blanket, blanket statement per se that could say how each of these sort of nuances is working together. An exhibition of Hugh Hayden's work titled Creation Myths is on view at Bainbridge House, Princeton University, until June 7th. His show titled American Food opens at Listen Gallery in London on March 11th. Cheryl Donegan is an artist whose work brazenly spans myriad creative fields, from performance and video to fashion and painting. Her recent forays into the potential of online custom printed apparel have layered her art with even more playful irony. It seems like all the things you've done, even your early videos, have to do with some interaction between like the human body and this other system, this kind mm. of kind of system that runs on its own in a certain way. Is that a thread line through all of it? I like that as a starting place because I think about like, um, I've been thinking a lot about categorical thinking, you know, as the example, like to be able to tell the difference between a snake and a stick <laughs> is going to help you through the woods. Mm -hmm. But it has certain limits, you know, when you're talking about like a lot of other types of uh, experience to 
talk about exactly the dilemmas we find ourselves in where we want to create our environment or, or have a, a, a say on you know what we're doing and what happens to us mm -hmm. and what we think but at the same time we're so um, inundated you know by uh, ideologies and 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 received ideas and I mean categorization is kind of like a, a, the good and the ill of the modern period it sort of makes things fall into line become efficient and systematic but it also creates these limitations in what somebody can do in any given circumstance. Sure, because, you know, it's like you get your ideas get fossilized and you just think that, um, you know, if it's in this category, it's going to behave this way. Yeah, or worse, it becomes controlled by the people who kind of make use of the categories and manipulate the categories in some way, right? Absolutely. You know, I was just thinking about, like, the... I mean, it might sound pretentious, but since we're both learning to speak French, I love that they have this word, plastician, like, for... An artist. Uh -huh. I think it's so marvelous because even just saying the word, the notion mm -hmm. of, of something that's plastic, it's like right. flexible, moldable, mm -hmm. it, does, it can be distorted. Moving materials around. It's a shapeshifter. The reason I gravitate towards that term is mm -hmm. because it kind of helps with decategorization. What I like about your work is that um, it, it, it exemplifies what I say about art, the art I like, the best art is art that's not almost not art. You know, plays with the edges, it tries to do things that don't normally fall into the categorization of art making. Yeah, I, I mean... And I don't think that's just a sort of naughty impulse on your it's, part. It's kind of been like a, a blessing and a problem because I'm always like, you know, I wanted to come up close to the thing it looks like but not be about that at all. Mm -hmm. And so, gee, that's a little tricky. Oh, what can I say? It intrigues me. I want to get yeah. close to the thing it's not, you know, or something. So, like, for example, I mean, I'll go to the most famous example with head. It's like, you know, the Your idea, video, your video yeah, head. Because it looks like porn. But because it l looks like porn, it's actually the opposite. It's ridiculously it's, innocent in yeah. a certain way, it's right? Like, it's like bobbing for apples. It's a stupid human trick. It reminds me of those um, aerobics videos. Remember when the three aerobics um, performers would be on this rotating disc and the camera was stationary and they would be doing leg lifts or something like that and then the camera would just randomly get these crotch shots certain things like that yeah. and it's it's in the guise of you know um, health and health instruction you know but of course it was completely erotic in some ways the same ways that like you know painters in the 19th century would paint paint nude figures um, as mythological things but of course the appeal of it was the eroticism of it I mean here is some sort of Catholic martyr you know, like half naked, you know, and, and of course, like what, what appealed to people and the artist knew this was that you're looking at a naked body, which you don't normally get to do that much. If you look at your work, then I think in some ways, um, even the fashion work with the, the sort of altered garments and the print on demand fabrics and those kinds of things, there's a body in the center of that, and that's often a very eroticized body. Um, in some ways, you're taking like mass-produced things and seeing how you can intervene in like that process, but also um, you're making use of that appeal of the allure of the body, the, the seduction of the body. Well, intervene is like a, a big word for for me, and you know sometimes that intervention is. Major, sometimes it's just minor or subtle. Because I like to play with words and stuff, so I was at a certain point terming the refashioned ready-made. As you say, like harking back to the ready-made, which I think is mm -hmm. definitely about erotics and pleasure, turning things over and sort of like poking them, you know, discovering like the gaps. Duchamp's urinal, which he put out in 1913 and scandalized the Armory Show, was a receptacle for a man's urine. You know, I mean, and he was his he was saying straight face that this is like the pinnacle of American culture modern plumbing but they always no matter what you do with it could be a uterus it could be a lot of it looks phallic you know at this male and female at the same time yeah. it's a porcelain cup mm -hmm. you know i mean and i mean that literally i mean that yeah. not just facetiously but like you know you upend the cup you know you 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 let it flow mm -hmm. you know but you think about like the different flows of the of the body and mm -hmm. like you know even flowing between like we're you know talking about si systems of like capital artisans crafted porcelain chamber pot you know from the porcelain cup to the chamber pot to the urinal it's like <laughs> re 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 rotations and revolutions in like who makes what and with what material and mm -hmm. what do you call it you mm -hmm. know what's our art and craft and, and mass production. I think all those things obviously were clearly at stake for an artist in the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah, and, what, and also what kinds of uh, human bodily functions do those things service? That's what we're trying to do now, it seems to me, grappling with technology. We're trying to sort of figure out where 
we still remain within that. I always told myself, like, I would understand old master painting better if I too shat on straw and only <laughs> lived by candlelight. Do you know, I mean, like, imagine right. that world where, like, you have, like... A physical like, experience yeah, of that environment. fine arrayments and, like, like everything was handmade and totally mm. artisanal. Getting back to, like, the refashioned ready-made, I kind of thought, like, it's like we click, we get an Amazon package, it comes to us, but, like, we can customize it. But could art participate in that, like, idea of like a ready-made but also like altering it and ordering it and altering it again. There, there were lots of tools. I made use of those things because it's like, you know, like instead of having a giant studio of, of, of artisanal laborers, uh, aka assistants, mm -hmm. you know, I could just fashion something on the computer and I would sort of be like making my own, you know, ready-made that comes mm -hmm. to me in a package on Amazon and mm -hmm. then I can like either choose to accept it as an artwork as is, which mm -hmm. I did mm -hmm. sometimes, or I could like use it as a material. It's like adapting stuff that's made in the world for certain functions to new functions. And I think in some ways it's what artists I think do best, not just critique, you know, whatever's going on, but actually kind of find ways to develop life through it, you know. How does the world evolve with all of these technologies? What do you do with Walmart once once it closes, as retail seems to be doing that? I'm saying hydroponic gardens. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Grow what you will, but you know, I'm thinking, yeah, what else? Hydroponic farming. I mean, what else could <laughs> or be there? weed farms. Well, you know, I don't care what they grow. But it's kind of an apocalyptic vision, and I guess I'm having a lot of those lately. But um, but like, what happens when you know the systems that we're we're sort of um, pushing to the limits right now. What happens when they just collapse? There's definitely these apocalyptic scenarios out mm -hmm. there and they're always deferred, mm -hmm. you know? And so I kind of wonder like, well, I don't have an answer, but I sort of wonder like, you know, we w part of these scenarios, I think there's a pleasure principle in that. Like uh -huh. we like to imagine and sort of fantasize about the worst. It's and titillating. I there's mean, something pleasurable yeah. about it. Well, yeah, we grew up, I mean, I grew up in the 70s and that was the, Poseidon um, Adventure. Sure, that was the epic of the disaster <laughs> film, which, right, you know, right. reflects a lot of cultural anxiety about, you know, change and right. I guess, you know, as a kid, but I don't know. I mean, what's kind of scary now is like the deferment of those scenarios, but we still have to deal with each other in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Do you know, like, so that's what's scary to me is that like, that might not happen, but other things will happen that will require us to like, share better mm -hmm. and that's going to be a huge problem. No, I think in some ways the gridlock in politics right now is just that the terms for the oncoming disaster, I think everybody feels it, but one side des describes it as a religious experience and they're actually kind of looking forward to it. Uh, yeah. And then the other side, you know, describes it as an environmental disaster and they're actually kind of looking forward to it too because it would then obliterate the shopping malls and we could all start start over as primitive man or some fantasy like that. Neither one of those scenarios is going to be particularly pleasant for anybody who's experiencing it. But in terms of like people trying to fix it politically right now, there's not really like a conversation in the middle. I think with the deferment is going to come a host of problems that we're, that we're not prepared to deal with that are more likely mm -hmm. instead of the fantasy that, you know, the rapture is going to come, which I think would be actually as a fantasy of simplicity. I don't really see like, you know, the planet will become uninhabitable for all humans. It's not going to be all at once. It's going to be in inc increments. Like, that's what we're looking at, I think. And so what happens in those increments, and do people learn to kind of work together to adapt through those different that's circumstances? That's what's scary to me, is the increments, because I think people <laughs> yeah. aren't good at that. In increments are not as, as um, dramatic and exciting as, you know, head-on disaster. Further categorizations are going to have to be made mm -hmm. of like, you know, and I think you see it already mm -hmm. happening now because the algorithm needs to be informed, right. but then the algorithm gets us wrong anyway. So mm -hmm. what's it all about, Alfie? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm like, do you think uh, it's our duty in some ways to kind of, you know, mess with the system? And I'm not talking about hacking here or anything like that, but I just think in our daily work to just kind of push against the edges of the box a little bit, no matter what you're doing. In most things, I, I just feel like the edges are more interesting than the center. Mm. It's not a political move, it's just the place you want to be. Yeah, I mean, hardy har, here I am in New York for 30 years, like in the center, so, you know, that's a little bit of a contradiction to what I just <laughs> said. But at the same time, like, even being in this 
center. I don't necessarily feel like I'm playing to the center. Sometimes the lessons that we learn like we're really young are the ones that just like really lodge in. And I remember it was probably 1982 in second year painting class, the teacher sort of stalking around the studio of all the little, you know, Aspiring artists. Aspiring beginner painters. <laughs> and giving a good critique to somebody and saying, well, that's a really fantastic painting. And he's like, but if you are too afraid to just paint a big red X over it, then you're not really like living or something. Right, right, right. It's important to learn that though. I mean, I think that the, the failure factor. I just was is... like, but if you've got, it was almost like if you've got a question and you, you're you too afraid to see it through, mm -hmm. Did you reach a point ever when you stopped thinking about that? Like, oh, I'm just faking it, I don't belong here? I think it's really recent because, you know, I'm not 30 anymore. I mean, if I felt as insecure about what I was doing now mm -hmm. at 50, almost 58, mm -hmm. than I did when I was 28, mm -hmm. something's wrong. I feel like what I'm doing is interesting, mm -hmm. enough to keep pursuing it, mm -hmm. and keeping on like building it mm -hmm. and and I, I feel like I, I like my faith has been rewarded to a certain degree yeah. I always have to believe like in my work that like the best is yet to come because I know more about myself and about it mm -hmm. so I can be more confident in it but that doesn't keep it from being disappointed and disappointing when people like don't get it or don't see it but right. like I guess I'm becoming more okay with that because mm -hmm. for myself I feel like I'm on the right track Cheryl Donegan's traveling exhibition titled Girls and Veils closed at the Aspen Art Museum in March 2019. The exhibition catalog, published by Kunstala Zurich, is available online. Donegan is currently featured in a show titled Factory Recall at Liberal Arts Roxbury until April 26th.